I am a brown-skinned, high femme, uh, Filipina American, with um, layered shoulder-length hair that is undyed, though very black, in a way that's kind of strange for a 53-year-old woman who's, who's you know, has a very big job. Like, why is my hair so black? You know, Obama became silver in a year, you know? So, um, you know, my makeup is really like thickly lined eyes. I like looking like a raccoon. Um, and with very red lipstick that matches my red hat, which I wore for all of you today. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share my work, um, which is all about my fourth book. And um, in the last couple of years, I wrote this book and I also made um, two feature films uh, during the pandemic. So I think you'll be curious about how I did that and what fuels that. And so that's the question I'm going to answer today. So grief uh, births my fourth sole authored book and it's called The Movies of Racial Childhoods. And it's forthcoming from uh, Duke in just about um, eight or nine months. And it coincides with the 10th year anniversary of my younger son, uh, Lacasse's death. And there he is. So as a grieving mom, I live in a deep, piercing pain that may bring you discomfort in how it fuels my study of Asian American childhoods in the movies, which is to connect to my child who is no longer developing. He lives with me as a permanent presence. And for those who meet me without having known him, they come to feel his being. And it may be too dark to come into proximity of my undertaking as a mother, author, and spectator, where creativity coincides very closely with devastation. Lacoste will come up again and again because my writing is a, an attempt uh, to will him to come back to life. For me to feel his precious life in experiencing movies about children at the ages that he could not have. He could not live in the past 10 years. And in writing this book, it helped me to imagine him at these ages that he could not have. So the act of creating, whether in books or movies, helps me crawl out of devastation. Lacoste died on Christmas Day in 2013 at age eight. Today, the memory of his body endures evermore in how I perceive mine. He remains undeniably part of my psychic self-understanding and physical self-perception. Without him, I am not the me I recognize, and it's not the me I intended nor ever wanted. My body knows his body, and he's here in the scar under my belly, which was his gateway into this world that we share. It is where he lived and where he remains in us, of us, among us. I could have died when Lacoste died, the stopping of his life threatened my own continuity. In counting how old he would be today, imagining his needs and his desires, and in honoring his life through writing this book, I still mother him. In a child's dying, that's the thing to remember for me, that this is the world where he remains and that I cannot go anywhere else to be with him. So this is the place that I must stay because this is the place where he is. So from reading films, as a grieving mother, author, and spectator, I finally recognize in his death that I am a very attached mother as a conscious response to my own neglected childhood. So 
the book about connecting with my child is also about how I must find my own life worth living. Now I go through sorrow and mourning as a creative act of self-fortification, which is rebuilding the self and flourishing, thriving, living anew in making this work take place in the world that is his too. So in this book, I am a devastated creator, asserting what I come to call an agentic attunement, which is an awareness of my children you know, that started immediately when they were born. And I find this practice really resonating in my own film spectatorship. The anticipation of my own children's needs awakens an alertness in me, and it's a feeling I recognize in myself every time a movie begins. My senses become alert and awake to the experience that's about to happen. So in my concept of agentic attunement, I define attunement as the attentive practice of observation that spawns from the position of a watchful mother, author, spectator towards a developing subject. From this role, I diagnose how movies help us mold and further develop ourselves through the process of interpreting key events, moments, and relations. So agentic attunement relies on this practice of keen observation of child development now towards the goal of their self-sovereignty, their autonomy, their independence, towards an, a healthy adult future. So agentic attunement teaches us how to take stock of and thoroughly identify the formative experiences of children. And this is ourselves included, so we may help transform and actualize them and ultimately ourselves as spectators to be who we wish to be, which is agents of our own lives, starring in our own movies. So what I'm doing is I'm extending this practice of agentic attunement to go beyond the interior world of the film. And I'm interested not only in children's diegetic relationships, but our own effective relationship to images on screen. Films capture embodied feelings within social worlds. So agentic attunement asks us to dissect images within their social context, noting how family roles and dynamics as sites where emotions situated within concrete worlds produce an understanding in the spectator precisely through that act of analysis, that making sense of, of, of the person within objects, within spaces. So this method captures the potential for film to calm suffering and give view to how we can transform our lives through interpretation. And the goal of this act of interpretation is to create a helpful narrative, a coherent narrative, to memorialize one's life in order to change your path. So agentic attunement captures the power of paying attention to experience, our experiences as spectators, as film scholars and filmmakers, to chart new directions due to the establishment of more helpful narratives in child and adult development in movies. So I'll tell you a bit about the literature that enables the work. So films enter our lives within the context of our entire lived experiences, from our childhoods with our families to our histories, desires, and relationships now. We analyze film as we experience it. How does this make sense? What of this world do I recognize? What does the film hail in my world now? We witness our own lives when making sense of a movie. We study characters as the agents of their lives, asking ourselves if we too are agents in our own. So films relay subjective experiences of events that we can analyze and relate to as we evaluate and measure our own autonomy then and now. So choices and actions are building blocks of film directing and film acting in ways that are parallel in spectatorship and psychoanalysis. Both entail interpretive acts of forming oneself in relation to others and through an evaluation of our representation and our relations. So the film that I opened with in the book is Lee Isaac Chung's movie Minari from 2020. 
In writing that film, he used the psychoanalytic approach of free association, which is a method that Sigmund Freud established over 100 years ago. So in creating uh, his film about racial childhoods, he took inventory of over a, about 100 childhood memories of his, intently listening to and evaluating those memories to generate a narrative arc, a coherent narration of his life through this act of memorialization. So Chung shows the link, in doing this, Chung shows the link between psychoanalysis and film fiction. Both interpret and prioritize the power of childhood experience and early childhood memory. So in creating a narrative arc, we then make sense of these events as not only of the past, but also what is currently real and actual to hopefully improve our own lives today. So the inventory of events that Lee Isaac Chung constructed reveals how the child's relationships to significant others, such as parents, grandparents, other adults, and peers, you know, shape self-perception. I wish I could underline and underscore that sentence because it's pretty critical to the kind of psychoanalysis that I'm going to be using that hasn't really been used before with the domination of our, of our use of psychoanalysis primarily in terms of urges and drives. My use of psychoanalysis is really much more uh, relational and relating not only to people but also our, our objects. So Minari's um, mother and father um, fighting about whether they should stay, um, the grandma's fun-filled exploration of their environment, adults highlighting the family's racial difference in a homogenous town, and white children questioning or accepting you know, the Korean-American family's presence across differences, these are all experiences that the child David you know, very um, uh, consciously notices and takes stock of. And these experiences narrate well what we may you know, feel as constituted towards his future adulthood. So through these experiences and the way that they're represented in the movie, we see that social forces act upon the characters and characters act and react to these forces, showing how they navigate others' narrations as they form their own self-perceptions. So we see six-year-old David asserting belonging by enthusiastically joining other children socially or defining his grandmother's foreignness to emphasize his own Americanness. So in the act of watching this film, you'll see his own act of creating narratives to make sense of these experiences. So both acts of his, you know, self-assertion, self-definition, are creative and teach us the importance of children as social agents. So this is what's so amazing about this film is that it says children deserve to be you know, main characters. So the filmmaker analyzes the subjective experiences of the child in constructing the film, and film psychoanalysis renders them analyzable through our interpretations. It is in the act of the film symbolizing and our subsequent interpretation that we can feel the child grappling with themselves as they enter and interact in the world, not as separate from but dependent on it in an ongoing way. That is, as children experience their emotions in conflict, which the film um, aims to dramatize, we see how the children act, cope, and create, and how they may risk rehearsing those same dramas into adulthood for Freudian reasons of reenacting pleasure or mastering trauma, like to repeat the same problematic behaviors that hurt you, and then you're doing it later in adulthood in order to make sense of it. So through these experiences and their subsequent interpretive choices, we see that children shape the world as they feel it and occupy it. And then when we watch the experiences of children, we also see how they establish their autonomy through their subjective relationship to the objects around them, including place, space, and people. So once again, those are the three, uh, that phrase is really critical to the, to the kind of psychoanalysis that I use, but before I get to that and give you some of the names of the people whom I had to read in order to understand this displacement of a kind of uh, Freudian uh, psychoanalysis, I need to talk to you about a couple of other concepts that, that make clear this different definition of sexuality that I'm working with, because as, as, as you know from my work, you know, I started out as a scholar by studying pornography. I mean, who does that before tenure? And I did, right? Because that's, that's where I felt the work had to go. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about sensuousness. So in this book, I evaluate Asian American films that represent childhood 
by using the philosophy of psychoanalysis. I came to psychoanalysis for the centrality of sexuality and aggression in its philosophy for my first three books, which contend with power relations across race and sexual representations. And, and as you know from my work, I am very unflinching about confronting explicit sex acts. And I really resent how Hollywood, you know, veers away, pans away from the sex acts. And it's such a fertile site of figuring out what people are doing and where they're at. And so all of my work goes precisely inside the deepest way what happens in the sex scene. So, so what, what I'm discovering in films about children, of course, is that that doesn't happen as much. And so um, what kind of sexuality am I working with? And why did I go back to psychoanalysis? So I return to psychoanalysis for different reasons now. And here I extend my approach to racialized sexuality by actually moving away from racialized sex acts and power relations towards what I'm calling a much more sensuous experience of mothering and parenting that one sees in childhood. So psychoanalytic approaches um, of observation enable us to practice agentic attunement to conceptualize intimate relations on screen, interpreting how that attachment shapes our lived experiences. So childhood and mothering, for me, involve acts of intimate attachment that describe the sensuous physicality of that relationship. So it's in the carnality of wiping feces off of babies, how the smear at times go up their backs, or how urine would occasionally fount in your eye when you're changing their diaper. And all of this demonstrate the kind of physical attunement that's needed in this very dependent relationship between child and caregiver. And I recall these experiences for myself as a very tethered dynamic between me and my infant children, where I learned how to detect when they wanted to stop eating or became aware of when they were going to um, poop or burp or cry. And you know, we developed this form of communication and developed a kind of forceful attachment through this sensuousness, through this intense attention to, to the physicality that depends on my own body. So I recognize the experiences children undergo as their own. You know, theorists have said even when the mother is breastfeeding the child, the child doesn't experience it, experience the breast as belonging to the mother, but belonging to themselves and vice versa. So I'm merely attempting to decipher their needs, even if it's separate you know, from my own body. So mothering for me combines awareness along with the action that arises to sustain another towards their independence, and that's, and that's the focus. It's a relationship um, of power in the sight of intense dependency. So the interchange from mother, parent, caregiver to a child is felt then and throughout life as mutual in the trust that my child learned and that I demonstrated as trustworthy in that experience. And this bond of trust, its failures, its successes, all contribute to the different kinds of subjectivities that I engage in in the book. Just a little bit more about the book, and I'm going to now begin talking about the, the different uh, contribution in the method that I use through the different literature that I use. So the movies of racial childhoods studies early 21st century televisual and cinematic narrative representations of racialization and its impacts on the sovereignty of children, particularly Asian American and Asian children and independent global cinema. So I look at films, I look at the series um, uh, about Andrew Cunana, and I look at the, um, the blossoming of Maximo Oliveros by Aureus uh, Solito, and I also look at the works of um, Diane Paragas, as well as um, Alice Wu. So devastation and exploitation are not the dominant themes in the stories of these Asian American childhoods and young adulthoods that we read about in this book. Oh, I also study on Andrew Ahn's films. Um, instead, we see a richer and wider range of childhood experiences. So my conceptualization of agentic attunement makes an extremely hopeful intervention by not focusing on, on those kinds of experiences, but, but the wider range of emotions that are represented that include uh, joy, happiness. Um, so in identifying how the child and young adult embark on the process of raising themselves. And they do this by taking seriously the project of tending to their own emotions and centering the self both empowering and enabling you know, the actions that they, that they take. So across each chapter, we witness how growing up 
as Asian American entails grief and mourning, as children and young adults contend with the bonds of attachment, feeling the racialized forces that construct Asian Americans as model minorities, including you know, premature adultification, in breeding overachieving children who don't play but instead are already doctors in their parents' minds by the time that they're 12, or even lawyers. So, and there's also at the same time the contestation of their sexual autonomy in a premature sexualization. So it's interesting, right? For Asian Americans, there's this coexistence of intense infantilization, but also premature adultification. And in terms of, and, and we see this throughout the movies that I study, but also we see this in terms of the literal loss of parents or the literal loss of home that they experience across these films. So while the parent or place appears as the object in key moments of their lives, events that have ramifications for confidence, self-assurance, and more, their death and loss, the death of a parent and the loss of a place, means there's a kind of realignment of the world that becomes the justification for the existence of the films in the first place. Um, so throughout this book, a parent's death may be the turning point in the film where a child leaves home just as they have a critical crossroads of development. So beyond interpersonal and interpsychic loss, children's autonomy and self-mastery in these films are fraught within these structures of racialization and sexualization and the particular structural circumstances of their families that shape and form individual subjectivity. However, the children emerge as agents of their own lives, starring in their own narrative stories due to the agentic attunement their caregivers practice or don't, or that they themselves take on as young people. So the bond between parent and child is not only a racialized, racialized one, but dependent on the structural conditions and historical circumstances where this relationship resides. So the bodily and psychic connection between me and my sons, for example, or any other parenting or caregiver, caregiving does not exist outside race and racism. The precarity of the mother's life, for example, is informed by the assumption that women of color have a higher tolerance for pain, by a history of forced sterilization or medical, in medical practices, or by the determination that they should not have ownership over their reproductive capacities or ownership of their own children. So for Asian American women, as I present in my first book, the sacrifice of children to white men who forsake them in Madame Butterfly in 1904 and Miss Saigon in 1989 and the various rehearsals of this trope, as if there are no other stories about Asian women and mothers, is also a form of perverse sexualization, that Asian women are partners for fornication but not for motherhood, um, you know, reproducing the bloodline, nor wifehood as an acceptable partnership. There's also the reality of the fear you know, black mothers face regarding the racial targeting of their children from Trayvon Martin to Tamir Rice that most white mothers don't experience. This is what visual studies um, scholar Nicole Fleetwood refers to as the casual violence of whiteness in her article, Raising a Black Boy Not to Be Afraid. As a woman of color raising brown boys and as a Filipina American refugee and immigrant, the experience of racialization and the work I do to prepare them for this world starts early as well. Racial identity impacts mothering not only in terms of social and cultural perception, but in self-perception and self-practice as mothers. We experience childhood and parenting unequally. Thus, my attention to racialized sexuality and representation continues in my approach to motherhood and childhood and in my refusal to universalize white experiences of innocence when addressing the experiences of childhoods of color who are deprived of innocence. So beyond uh, sex acts, racial and sexual innocence in childhoods requires a, a different um, method of, and literature and psychoanalysis. So while my first book engaged in the mythic representation of Asian American women as hypersexual beings, my second book addresses the Hollywood images of Asian American men as tethered to a straitjacketed definition of sexuality. And the third book looks at transnational intimacies between radically unequal subjects to explore um, the range of relationships across race and sexuality that are represented in movies. This particular book looks at the narrative of growing up within precarity and within grief for different kinds of racialized Asian American sexual identities and capacities. So a different form of sexuality emerges in this book as well. As they grow up, children possess themselves, including their own sexuality. 
which I define as an inkling, a feeling, and an expression of their own desires, wants, and preferences, including a lack of interest in others. However, this does not occur in a vacuum. The racialized and sexualized character informs the meaning of their expression and, and reception by others. So my study, by necessity, has to go beyond drives, urges, and instincts that has been the way we have utilized psychoanalysis in the past to assert the social and relational aspects of the formation of sexuality. So I think of, you know, I think a good illustration of this is, is the 14-year-old Laotian boy, Konarak uh, Sinsampong, who, bleeding, distraught, and with a hole drilled into his head, essentially lobotomized by the serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer, fled the killer's apartment building um, to the horror of his neighbors, uh, Glenda Cleveland and her daughter, among the other black women neighbors who were standing by, attempting to protect the boy, the police believed Konarak, who was a young teen, to be a consenting adult lover simply based on the explanation of the white male serial killer who would then soon strangle the boy to death. The policeman who let him go later explained in defending his actions that to his trained eye, he did not see anything improper in handing over the incapacitated brown child to the white adult man. So in this situation, the Southeast Asian boy is overdetermined by fantasies about him in a kind of pornographic adultification. Indeed, there is a long transnational history of brown Asian children facing interpolations of not only interruptions in and disruptions to their sexualities as they grow into adulthood. You know, the policeman, egregiously unparent, refused agentic attunement to the child in the face of this calm, white-skinned, blonde-haired, and blue-eyed psychopath, narrating a different story about the adult status of the Laotian American immigrant child, who was clearly suffering, distraught, and in physical pain right there in front of him. An abject subject's pain remained invisible and his future did not matter. Of these differently valued subjectivities, the white male serial killers prevailed. So what would happen if children of color were granted agentic attunement, the same nurturing and protection accorded to white children so they may fashion their own adulthoods without undue constriction? So within social, structural, and interpersonal relations, racialized childhood is an aggravated site of struggle for self-sovereignty, which I define as confident, independence, uh, self-possession, autonomy, and the ability to access self-determination within the context of specific Asian and Asian American narratives. So my previous books, as does this one, attends to the local, global, and diasporic, the rural and the urban, the historic and the present, as all infusing each other in a vision of a global Asian and Asian American world reflecting the migrations and movements of people, as well as the relentless questioning of their citizenship in the United States, where they have been for multiple generations. I look at the lives of individuals as shaped by these historic, political, social, and economic structures, which they also resist and critique, even as children. And I center their perspective as children in dealing with the imposition of adults on their self-perceptions, including their desires and how they wish to grow up. I'm interested in viewing these perspectives as if they were the children's memoirs in the film, or what Diana Taylor calls a repertoire of embodied memory in relation to the archive of recorded history, which represents the adult version of the same childhood. I show the entanglement with the young people's own interior desires and the external forces that define them in films made by adults that represent these racialized and sexualized childhoods. You know, films that focus on Asian American children can help us identify the ways in which they do or don't experience nurturing and protection in agentic attunement. And if they experience ambiguous and open-ended narratives that enable them to have freedom and in an infinity of possibility, the better for achieving future freedom. So in my address of child development, the films I study enabled me to clarify the kind of psychoanalysis that informs this book, one that departs from the centrality of drive, ego, and instinct that are most associated with Freud to approaches that have defined, um, that have developed since his uh, philosophy and practice were established in the earlier uh, 20th century. So Freud's clinical practice of attuned, neutral listening to the patient on the couch 
were expanded years later to methods of child and, and infant observation by Melanie Klein and Donald Winnicott, who founded uh, this branch or the school of psychoanalysis um, called Object Relations. And the other is Heinz Kohut, interestingly enough, who worked in the Monterey Bay area, uh, who founded uh, the, the study of uh, self psychology. Um, they pretty much worked in the early middle to later middle 20th century. So both object relation psychoanalysis and self-psychology address what should be the optical, optimal conditions for child uh, development. The central difference in these later psychoanalytic approaches that stem from Freud are in the focus on the independent role of others in relation to the formation of self. So the psychoanalyst Fred Pine argues that Freud had his object relations theory but the formal status he gave to the object was drive-based. That is, the object was that person, part of that person, part of the self, or the thing through which gratification of drive was attained. So it comes from that particular subject. But rather than center drives as urges and the gratification of those drives as the end point, object relations and self-psychology evaluate the intrapsychic and interpersonal role of the other in developing oneself. So whether it's the parent or another kind of object of attachment that the child you know, you know, holds. And self-psychology uh, prioritizes self-formation as something that's different, separate, and with one's own agency and self-esteem. So this book continues my scholarly goal of amplifying the voices um, of filmmakers of color or characters of color, and performances by actors of color. What is delicate about this new step and new direction is that movies are mostly made by adults, and the representation of children's experiences are limited by recollection or projections over what can be vast amounts of time for the adult authors representing younger people. So our cinematic understanding of childhood and intimacy can only be made through inference and assumption as Catherine von Stockton also theorizes. We are limited in what we can know due to the complexities of representations. For the past 20 years, my books, articles, and films have addressed the complexities of moving images in relation to the problems and politics of sex and gender in Asian American and their diasporic contexts. And the intervention of my work is threefold. I address the power of representation in shaping our social institutions our interpersonal and group relations, and our intimate self-understandings. And simultaneously, I exposed the dangerous lack of diversity in film and media production, and in the critical voices that frame our discussions. And then, I looked directly and unflinchingly at challenging relations on screen in order to offer new ways of thinking about and imagining our relations anew off-screen. And finally, I'm invested in the ambiguity of cinematic language, to enable an infinity of meanings for subjects of color who have been colonized on film as knowable, secured by the tradition of limited images where people of color are antagonists in relation uh, to white protagonists. As spectators and filmmakers of color, we need to access the inexpressibility of complex experiences that cinema aims to represent. I mean, that's what makes cinema great when you can't figure it out. That's why I just lambast the demand for positive images. You know, this is what it means to access representation, is not simply for visibility, but for how cinema can represent inexpressible things, uh, verbal, oral, or any singular version you know, of the senses. Representations of childhood are inherently speculative and partial, reflecting an unknowability which should be maintained. Childhood is rendered you know, within the limits of memory, not by the people living these important ages, but by those who may still be affected by the origin stories that arise from those times that become seminal memories for them as adults. And what's crucial too is if they have contended with the meanings of their experiences consciously through agentic attunement, or if these experiences remain unprocessed and confusing with continuing ramifications for themselves that then appear and continue in their work, this is the dilemma that my book addresses in advocating for conscious engagement, analysis, and interpretation to encourage filmmakers and spectators to become agents in their own lives. Now, we begin the interactive part that I warned you about. 
um, where I actually welcome you to link your own process with mine in, you know, see how I began this talk today by sharing my own story, like the, the kernel of the energy that enables me to complete the work and do the work. And so here, possibly, are some questions that you're asking. So I'm going to share them so that we can start from a deeper place than, than here, right? And I want you to use this time to sharpen your questions and so that you can ask them. And as you can see, this is the thing that I like to say, if you're thinking, you should just ask it. Like, clean your space. And that's pretty much what we do when we're writing books and making movies. If it's a question for you, you should answer it in whatever form that it needs to take, right? So, um, how do your own histories come to play in your own work? Um, you know, my, oh, my first books on uh, sexuality came from the need to figure out how to read explicit sex acts, especially for Asian women when, you know, people come up to me and say, you have a slanted vagina, you, you have a proclivity for perverse sexuality, I want to try you out. Yeah, that's pretty much what they're saying when they make these comments, right? So I wanted to understand that scene, you know, and where it comes from, and, and how it was um, represented. And I wanted to understand, you know, I didn't really watch pornography until I became a scholar, and then I became a pornography scholar because I had to study what they were saying about Asian women in, in, in these, you know, uncensored ways as a site where you could identify the fantasy. Like, what composes that fantasy? What is it that they're saying? What is it that they want? And so that's, that's why I had to go. I had to go to Kinsey so many times because I needed to, to see it. Um, and as you can see, this book comes from my own proximity to death. And certainly, you know, as you can see, the, the personal history really comes from the need for self-recognition and the need for self-regard as a true motivator for me. Like, why the books will get written, because I need to figure out the questions. And, you know, I think it requires a certain kind of, you know, um, self-belief, you know, that the questions that you're asking are worth answering, that they not only deserve your attention, but the attention of others. And then the other question, the second question that you may be thinking about is, what makes a project worth pursuing? What questions are worthwhile? This book took me four years to write, um, and, and a lot of reading new books. Um, and, you know, my practice is I watch the movies that I write about at least six to seven times. Um, and sometimes there are movies that I have to let go, you know. Um, they're in my queue and I would just look at them. And it was too scary. I would watch them and then I would watch them again five months later. And then I watched them six, seven more times and I, I can't touch it. So there were particular movies that I had to let go and there were movies that I let go also at the very last minute. It was too hard. Um, the need to create a coherent narrative about a vexing thing. The need to create a coherent narrative about a vexing thing. That is what I'm trying to do when I write. In order to help people stop suffering. To help them find a way to do new things instead of the rehearsal of those painful and traumatic um, habits. Uh, the third question, what makes a question worth the years of investment and demand? So I think it's pretty critical to not know the answers to the questions and to need the answers to the questions and to keep open to where the work takes you. Um, like, you know, having to study pornography from eight to five at the Kinsey for many weeks at a time. Having to go to the Midwest when I was making my last film during the pandemic and spending a lot of time there. Um, and in studying sex and race, I mean, these are the sites of denigration. I mean, movies are the sites of denigration. You know, um, you know yesterday I thought, I, I, took, I took a lot of, I took 60 students to the Disney Family Museum and we saw The Jungle Book, which to me, you know, The Jungle Book is uh, animation, innovation, you know, pinnacle. You don't see animals moving that way until you see The Jungle Book. But it was also extremely painful because it was such an illustration of Rudyard Kipling's brown people cannot govern themselves because they're too close to nature. You know, so it was just such a tremendously painful experience. But so many people watching the movie with me thought it was a movie about kindness and friendliness. And meanwhile, it was completely tortured. You know, and of course we share amazing moments in animation because animation, animators are so funny and so they just like to do funny things. And it's hilarious, yes, but most of the time it was extremely painful. 
Um, so, because race and sex are sites of denigration, people also become very afraid for me that I'm doing this work. And they also become very afraid for themselves about why I'm doing this work. And you have to accept the fearlessness and the courage that's needed knowing that not everybody has it. And if you have it, then it's worth pursuing. Because new knowledges will emerge that may be needed. The fourth question is, what literatures are needed to contribute new knowledge to a problem? I am for sure a social problem-based thinker, and I feel responsibility uh, to history and uh, context in determining um, uh, the parameters of a problem. And I live um, and love in the, you know, just really trying to figure out what is the role of particular cultural objects in the psychic life of our nation, you know? Um, and all of this determines what I read so as to be prepared. You know, like, the, the, the books that I love to read for fun are sexual histories of, of places, of cities, you know, like gay New York, you know? Um, Interzones, you know? And at the same time, over the past four or five years, I now was reading these books that were written by and written for practicing clinical psychoanalysts, you know? And I'm looking at it not as a practicing clinical psych psychoanalyst, but really as a theoretical, philosophical um, psychoanalyst. So I am grounded in a, you know, in a kind of disrespect of disciplinary boundaries. And, um, and for me, I think this is, this is pretty critical, you know, to, in terms of the purpose of research, to arm yourself to do right to your subject by lining yourself up with people who came before you and people who are doing this work, like who's your gang, who are the people on whose shoulders you're standing, and how can these people help you work in ways that can help you? So to me, the literature is who are your people? Um, the fifth question is, what method is best? You know, because I'm also a uh, filmmaker, super interdisciplinary uh, scholar, and, you know, I'm also doing all of this work while I'm being a dean, which is a, a very big, beyond a full-time job, but at the same time, because you're, when you're a dean, you're taking care of everybody, you're taking care of other people's problems, you're, you're trying to figure out climate and culture, and I think I'm not able to excel as a dean unless I'm doing my own work, which is for myself. And it reminds me of who I am, you know? And of course, it's very tied to the work that I have to do when I'm evaluating the faculty, you know, because I need to have undergone what they're also going through. Um, and I also just love historians of race and sexuality. Um, and I love ethnography and interviewing and was trained in it. And my filmmaking, and I think you can see from the way I, I write and think and read, I also write as a director and I also write as a production designer in terms of really paying attention to the movement of people in space, for example how you block a scene, you know, how you, how you construct, how you, how you construct the perspective of, of the scene, how you give access to the scene. So for me, I really respect how the objects demand a particular method and I listen as hard as I can uh, to it. Uh, when I asked my graduate students, I said, I'm going to this conference and they want me to talk about how I make movies and how to write books. And I said, give me your questions. What do you want to learn from me? And the number one question they asked me was, how do you get your work done? Um, how do you maintain a happy family? How do you maintain a healthy relationship with your children and your partner? And how do you excel in your job? Um, so I think it goes beyond time management. I think it's really very relational answer. For me, the key is I find the most intimidatingly smart people I know, and I befriend them, and I make them read my work with a deadline, but because I'm so intimidated by them, I will never fail the deadline. Because I want them to respect me, <laughs> and I want them to not feel resentment toward the work that I'm asking them to read. And um, these are the same people who have been reading my work since I was a grad student, and I've added more people along the way. And once again, it's the people I find the most intimidatingly smart, brilliant people, and I want them to be on my side, and I want them to um, to help me uh, identify my blind spots. At least three people read my work before it goes out in the world. 
Um, and I'm very grateful that they're available to me. And I also think that you should always go for um, the top presses and find the harshest analysis you can get, knowing that it's an opportunity you know, to make the work better. And it also helps you to recognize when it's not relevant, the critique, but you're getting the critique and it's good to get it um, ahead of time. So it's kind of a combination of curiosity and thick skin that you have to develop. And maybe you're curious, what am I working on next? What is, where are you now with your uh, next project? And I only answer this question if I think people are ready, because my next projects are extremely frightening. Like I'm super scared of them. And I'm looking at you and I'm like, can you handle how scary it is, you know? And um, it happened to me yesterday, somebody, a major donor asked me, what are you working on next? And I said, trying to figure it out. Because they, <laughs> they can't really <laughs> know. But I, I met with a filmmaker uh, earlier today and we really got into it in terms of what I'm trying to do. It's both a film and a movie. But what's amazing is that um, I have a film and a book. The book is going to be done in a year. Because as I told you, the deadlines, I meet them. I, I don't fail deadlines. Because I'm giving them to super intimidatingly smart people who I want to impress. It really works for me as a thing. It's, it's love. You know, it's not fear. It's love. You know? And love is more motivating than fear. And what's really exciting to me is that they don't exist now, but they will. And isn't that great? And, um, and because I have this very demanding job, you know, and my job, I think, is also very similar to what I'm trying to do as a filmmaker, which is, and as a film scholar, which is demonstrate my accountability to the communities that I come from and the communities um, I bring. Because I believe that my work has the capacity you know, to reach people most intimately, right? I mean, luckily, I'm a scholar, so all these students have to read my books, you know? And I imagine that moment, you know, where they're sitting under a tree, or they're in bed, or they're on a desk, and they're reading my work. I just, I, I respect that moment, you know, so seriously, this ability to just walk into their lives so intimately. And, um, and the reason I think that that really motivates me is because I really want to ease their suffering. I really want to ease their loneliness, and I want to ease their vexation. So thank you for the opportunity to identify why I write, and how I write, and why I make movies, and how I make movies. I'm very grateful, and it's fun being at UCLA, because this is where I learned how to become a filmmaker at um, UCLA Film School. You know, I, I learned how, to, I could figure out, like, you know, the, the, the intercutting system in Hollywood, I couldn't figure it out. Like, how do you bring people into a movie? So I figured it out here, you know, in East Melmans, and I figured out how to block a scene. And going to film school really enriched my life because every day and every moment I have an interaction, I'm making a movie, you know? I'm always blocking the scene and really trying to figure out how, how do you shoot a scene when someone's sitting, someone's standing, how someone's walking in a park, you know? So um, I think it's a certain kind of hyper-aliveness, you know? So I think I'll end by saying that I really thought that I would die after my son died. And actually kind of sadly feel more alive you know than I've ever been and I just want to seize that life and make work as a memorial to his life. Thank you so much.